All right, so let's talk about eukaryotic cells. Now, um, you know, pretty much everything that I talk about in this lecture uh, is going to be relevant to probably most eukaryotic cells, not just um, eukaryotic microbes. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a little bit into some stuff that's kind of microbe specific. Um, and in this video, I'm going to be uh, specifically looking at the internal structures of eukaryotes. And you can see on this cartoon here, um, there's a lot more going on inside the eukaryotic cell than there was in the prokaryotic cell. Um, you know, lots of, of uh, uh, you know, internal organelles, membrane-bound stuff. And here you can see the cutaway cartoon view. And this right here is a transition or a transmission electron micrograph. Um, and you can see a picture of an actual cell with all of its, you know, awesome internal membranes and stuff like that. So the first most important organelle um, is the nucleus, right? That's, that's the thing. That's the thing that makes you a eukaryote. You could theoretically be missing any of the other stuff and still be a eukaryote. But if you don't have a nucleus, it's really hard to be a eukaryote. So... What is the nucleus? Well, the nucleus's main job is to contain the DNA. Um, and in eukaryotes, the DNA is um, in what are typically multiple linear chromosomes. And uh, the DNA, under most circumstances, when the cell isn't dividing, that DNA is going to be packaged up into... Uh, a DNA plus protein complex called uh, chromatin. Um, and so most of this stuff that you see in here is chromatin. And under most circumstances, when the cell isn't undergoing mitosis, this chromatin is sort of diffuse throughout the nucleus, right? That isn't to say that it's unorganized. It actually is organized. But it's not as compact as it could be. It's open enough that at least you can get to parts of it and express them. Um, the, well, most of the, the, uh, um, the nucleus contains chromatin. Um, there is a region which does have some chromatin in it, but also has quite a lot of RNA, and this is called the nucleolus. That's not a membrane-bound structure. It's just a region of the nucleus. And the nucleolus is where um, ribosomes are made and tested before they go out to the rest of the cell. And this area between the nuclear membrane and the nucleolus is called the nucleoplasm. Right? And uh, this membrane on... Uh, you know, that bounds the nucleus is a very special membrane. It's the nuclear envelope, is what it's called. And it is a double membrane. And by double membrane, I don't mean that it's a lipid bilayer. All membranes are lipid bilayers. I mean it's a double lipid bilayer. You've got a lipid bilayer, which you can see sort of here. And then you have a second lipid bilayer. All right? Most organelles don't have that structure. Um, and this external lipid bilayer is actually going to fold out and become the membrane of some of the other stuff that we're going to talk about fairly soon. Uh, the nuclear envelope contains pores in it. These pores are large-ish structures. Um, that are very highly regulated. Uh, they have, um, they're basically gated, and only things with a certain tag can get through these gated pores. 
Um, some small things can get through rather easily on their own, but most bigger things like proteins and RNA and stuff like that, it, it has to be let in or out through this gate that is, is very highly complicated and regulated. Um, the nucleus is, of course, where gene expression takes place. The DNA, or at least what we call the nuclear DNA, stays in the nucleus and hopefully doesn't leave because there's no real reason for it to leave. Um, if you need to access it, you copy it into RNA and then that RNA leaves through one of the pore complexes. So moving out from the nucleus, we get to the endoplasmic reticulum or more commonly abbreviated ER, all right? Because endoplasmic reticulum is sort of a mouthful. Now, the endoplasmic reticulum usually starts right outside the nuclear envelope and is in fact contiguous with it. So you can see here, um, there are some flaps, let's see. So these flap here um, would actually fold over and would become the outer membrane of, so this thing would actually like, you know, come here, it would fold over, and then this would become the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope. And so there are various places where, usually it pours, where the outer layer of the nuclear envelope is gonna go off and become uh, endoplasmic reticulum. And so if you were to like label a lipid in the nuclear envelope with a fluorescent dye, which is a thing that you can do, and just let it like float, you might see it float over to the endoplasmic reticulum. Next time you look at the cell, it might be out in the ER. Uh, there are two basically subcompartments of the endoplasmic reticulum, and they do totally different things, and they actually look fairly different as well. Um, there's what's called the rough ER, which you see here. The rough ER is structured as sort of a big group of flat flaps, right? So big flat folds going back and forth, all interconnected by pathways, but they're big flat foldy things. And they're called the rough ER because these big flaps are um, covered in um, ribosomes. Now there's basically two places in a eukaryotic cell where uh, proteins are made. You can have proteins be made in the cytoplasm by just like what are called free ribosomes. And they typically make proteins in the cytoplasm that are gonna stay in the cytoplasm. Some of them will actually go get re-imported into the nucleus and a few of them will go into a few other organelles, but for the most part, it, it, if it's made just in the cytoplasm, it stays in the cytoplasm. If uh, a protein is made in the rough ER, then it's going to stay within what's called the endomembrane system, which is the nucleus endoplasmic reticulum, uh, Golgi, and then from there to other organelles. Um, lysosomes, peroxisomes, or be destined for the surface, outer membrane of the cell, or even be exported from the cell. All right. So uh, this rough ER is the site of protein production, or it's a major site of protein production. And the protein is produced on these foldy flat on the surface of these foldy flaps. That's why there's so many foldy flaps. It's to increase surface area that's available. Um, the other part of the endoplasmic reticulum is the smooth ER. And as you can see over here, it looks much more like 
uh, this complicated system of like caverns and tunnels um, rather than being like a bunch of big long flaps. No ribosomes here. Um, and in most cells, there's going to be less mass of it, but there are lots of exceptions to that. Um, the smoothie R has two main functions. Uh, first is that this is where lipids are made, all right? So this is where membrane is born, where phospholipids get made. All new membrane that gets made gets made in the smooth ER. Um, and this is also where other lipids like oh, cholesterols and triglycerides and even steroid hormones uh, get made. Um, the second thing is that the smooth ER is involved in detoxification. Um, so it tears apart molecules, um, particularly organic molecules, um, well, particularly hydrophobic organic molecules, um, and uh, destroys them, right? And, and I'm not talking about taking apart like proteins or DNA or RNA or any of the major, major biopolymers. That happens somewhere else. But toxins are usually small organic molecules and a lot of them are going to be destroyed by enzymes in the smooth ER. Um, one thing that I do want to note, right, so is the name here. Endo means inside. Plasmic, right? We said plasm means like goo. But in this case, that means endo, inside the cytoplasm. Reticulum, reticula is a, an old Latin word that basically means net or network. Um, and so like when you look at these under a very powerful microscope, what you see is that like all of these flaps, fold, tunnels, they're all interconnected. So they all form this vast network. So this is the, the network inside the cytoplasm. That's basically what the name means. The Golgi. All right, so uh, I'm actually going to draw some endoplasmic reticulum here. So uh, I'm not going to draw it very well, but All right. So this is the rough ER up here, and. Um, there are ribosomes on it, of course. I drew this on the wrong side, but whatever. So those are ribosomes, and those ribosomes make, like, proteins, which are stuck in the rough ER. Now what happens is these ends of the flaps will sort of pinch off and become vesicles. Oops. Containing proteins. And these are freshly made proteins just made in the rough ER and they need to go for processing. All right, and I, I, I drew this rough ER on the wrong side, unfortunately, because this is the side that faces the ER, so just pretend like that. Um, but so the vesicle is gonna float from the rough ER to what's called the cis face of the Golgi. And the Golgi, again, is going to be shaped like a bunch of, a stack of flat foldy bits. It looks kind of like a stack of pancakes, right? And vesicles from the ER are going to come over here to the cis side of the Golgi apparatus, which means the side facing the nucleus. And then they're going to merge with the Golgi 
and drop their proteins off inside. Now, Golgi is often referred to as central shipping and receiving, right? And like a big warehouse, like stuff comes in, it gets repackaged, and then it goes out. So the proteins that get dumped in here are just like random proteins, whatever got stuck in that vesicle. So imagine you work in a big warehouse and like every day you get like huge container shipments from China that have just stuff, like whatever Walmart was ordering. And it's just like all sorts of different stuff crammed all haphazard inside of these big shipping containers that come in. And your job is to take them and sort them by type and destination. And also to tag them. You're going to put a little barcode on them so you can track them everywhere that they need to go. That's basically what the Golgi does. It's going to take these proteins that came in and it's going to sort them. As they move through the Golgi, these proteins are going to get tagged with uh, uh, with with the uh, uh, sugars, with short polysaccharides, and each short polysaccharide has a specific sequence to it, and that's like a barcode that tells you where that protein needs to go. And then proteins that are all going to the same place will end up being sorted to the same area. So those are going to one place, this is going to another place, these over here are going to a third place, usually on what's called the trans side of uh, the Golgi, which means the side facing away from uh, the nucleus. And then these things will bud off into vesicles and head off to wherever their final destination is. And so as proteins move through the Golgi, they get sorted into proteins that are all going to the same place. They get tagged and bagged, put together, and then shipped off to the right place. Lysosomes, peroxisomes, and vesicles. I'm not going to show you pictures of these because they all basically look the same, which is that they all look kind of like this. Right? They're small circular vesicle looking organelles. Um, they do have very different functions though. So lysosomes, lyse means to cut. Zome, by the way, means body, as in somatic. Um, but these are cutting bodies and what they're gonna do is digest biopolymers. So things like proteins, DNA, RNA, uh, some lipids, um, triglycerides certainly, uh, those are going to get uh, carbohydrates as well, um, at least polysaccharides, um, can go to the lysosome. And in the lysosome, you have all sorts of cutting enzymes. And those cutting enzymes will take these big, long polymers and chop them into monomers. It takes proteins, turns them into amino acids, takes DNA, turns it into nucleic acids, uh, takes you know, fats and turns it into glycerol and fatty acids, that sort of thing. Um, most of this is going to be material that has been phagocytized in many cells, like if you eat another cell, you send it to the lysosome, and that's where it gets digested and torn apart. Um, although also, like, internal proteins that get damaged and need to be recycled will also get sent to the lysosome. Uh, peroxisomes. So peroxy comes from peroxide. Some is a body. And a peroxide is a... Oxygen, oxygen bond. So this that I've drawn here is hydrogen peroxide, which is hydrogen, oxygen, oxygen, hydrogen. So this peroxide bond is important because it's, it's extremely unstable. Oxygen does not like to be bound to other oxygens because 
oxygen is an electron hog. And when you got two strong guys fighting over the same two electrons and they struggle back and forth, this tends to disassociate into what's called a free radical, which has an unpaired electron and is extremely reactive and dangerous. It goes around stealing a... a Stealing electrons from other things, randomly breaking bonds inside of the cells. It's a really nasty chemical to have inside of your cells. Um, and uh, it's unfortunately, it's a byproduct of aerobic metabolism. So if you do aerobic metabolism, if you use oxygen to get energy, then that oxygen goes through a peroxide intermediate. Some of those peroxide intermediates leak out from the mitochondria or wherever. And if they get out into the rest of the cell, they can do real damage. So peroxisomes um, have enzymes called catalases that uh, can take this hydrogen peroxide and can safely turn it into oxygen and water, right? So they, they get rid of this dangerous free radical forming byproduct. Um, oxygen's actually very poisonous, as we'll discuss in uh, a, a, a lecture fairly soon. Um, the other thing that peroxisomes do is that they are uh, involved in um, detox. So, uh, since you got this compartment that's full of all of these dangerous peroxides that tear things up, right? Some molecules are just really, really hard to break down, particularly lipids and lipid-based molecules. So you might throw all of those things into the lion's den, the peroxisome, where they're going to get torn up by all of the peroxide in there. Um, and uh, so peroxisomes are used for the digestion of lipids, fatty acids, and detox. Um, and they get rid of these peroxides, which are very dangerous. Uh, vesicles are just like membrane-bound sacs. They're transitory. Usually, if you're moving something from one component to another, you stick it inside of a vesicle, you move the vesicle to wherever it's going, and then you blorp merge the vesicle with whatever the destination is, whether that destination is the Golgi or whether it's the outside of the cell. Um, so they're containment and transport units. Mitochondria and chloroplasts. Most of you probably generally familiar with these. Uh, mitochondria are these long kind of bean-shaped things. They're almost always drawn with these folds inside of them called creestae or creases. These are foldings of the inner membrane. Yes, you heard me right. These are double membrane structures, just like the nucleus. Um, and this inner membrane is folded in these creestae to increase surface area. And what do we all know about the mitochondria? It's the powerhouse of the cell. To put a little bit more of a fine point on it, this is where most of a cell's ATP gets made. Specifically, it's the ATP that is made from oxidative phosphorylation, which is the process by which you use aerobic respiration or use oxygen to make ATP, right? You can make ATP through another method called fermentation in glycolysis, that happens in the cytoplasm, doesn't happen in the mitochondria. So even cells without mitochondria, like say red blood cells, can make ATP. But um, cells with mitochondria can make ATP a lot more efficiently. I should point out that um, some bacteria can do the same thing, even though they don't have their own internal organelle structures for it. Um, these uh, mitochondria are going to have these internal folds. The internal folds are where the actual ATP gets made um, and where the electron transport chain 
um, which is the main energy generating mechanism happens. Um, this inner bit of the mitochondria that's actually inside um, the inner membrane is called uh, the matrix, and that's where sugars are torn apart and rated for their electrons. Chloroplasts um, are kind of similar to mitochondria, but usually bigger and shaped very differently. Um, they actually have a, three membranes. They have an outer membrane, they have an inner membrane, and then most chloroplasts have this extremely inner thalicoid membrane, which makes these stacks. Um, each, like, coin in this stack is called a thalicoid, and a, a stack of them is called a granum. Um, the, these, these thalicoids are where, um, where light is harvested. Um, so that's where light is captured. Uh, and then the, the inside, what's called the stroma, which is what's going to be surrounding the thalicoids, uh, that's where you take ATP that's generated from light in the granum and use that ATP and carbon dioxide to make, well, sugars. Interestingly, both mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own DNA. So each of them has their own DNA genome. Actually, they have like hundreds of copies of, a D, uh, of the same DNA genome. And that DNA genome is circular, and it looks like a bacteria genome. And that genome is transcribed into RNA, and that RNA is translated into proteins by ribosomes inside the mitochondria, or inside the chloroplast. And those ribosomes inside the chloroplast or mitochondria that make chloroplast and mitochondria proteins, they're bacterial ribosomes. Now, uh, both mitochondria and chloroplast have actually lost the ability to make most proteins. Um, most of their processes are taken care of for them by the outer cell. They can't live on their own. But they do make um, the most important proteins, the ones that are found on their inner membranes, themselves, usually. And uh, so it's thought that these were a product of what's called endosymbiosis. Long, 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 long ago, um, some... Early primitive prokaryote ate a bacteria that could do this really useful thing. It could photosynthesize or it could use oxygen. And for whatever reason, it ate this thing but didn't digest it and kept it around because it was useful. And eventually, they became completely interdependent to where the outer cell cannot live without the mitochondria, and the mitochondria can't live without the outer cell, and then it just became part of it. But the way mitochondria are, like, made is that they undergo binary fission, much like um, bacterial cells do, um, and they have their own internal DNA and their own internal, uh, what's called, um, ribosomes. So, here's a quiz for you. Which of the following organelles contain DNA? Hopefully you were just listening right now. Go ahead, take a pause and think about this if you need to. All right, the right answer. So, the nucleus definitely contains DNA. I hope you got that one. And the mitochondria. 
contains DNA. Endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi, lysosome, they do not. All right, so I'm going to end this video here, um, and I'm going to pick up with the second half later on.